Most alarmingly is the demonization of the media. Anything that, that doesn't agree with how I want things to come out is all of a sudden fake news. Are we in a post-truth world where there is actually something called alternative facts? The, the commercial media, especially when we're talking about broadcast, is extremely big business. The scary thing is you've got people out there that are pretending to be news. At best, it's opinion. At worst, it's made up. That is absolutely patently false. But because it fits with what we already want to believe, so then we'll just take it and we'll just swallow it and eat it and the truth be damned. <laughs> but we can't be like that. You be a savvy media consumer. And unless you want to go out and get your own reporting, you're going to have to trust somebody. We're living in a time of converging crises amid a pandemic, economic uncertainty, cries for social justice, riots, insurrections, and a frontline battle of truth and misinformation. We're also living in a time where the media itself has become as much of the focus as the news it covers. Mimi Girgis is a veteran broadcaster in TV and radio. She was the host and executive producer of The Mimi Girgis Show, which aired nationally for almost 16 years on Sirius XM Radio and PBS. Her show featured some of the most influential Washington, D.C. power brokers, as well as leaders and luminaries from around the world. In this interview, we discuss how the media really works from a real media insider. Does the media have its own agenda, or are they giving us exactly what we want? You decide. Hello, and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Mimi Girgis. Mimi, what an honor it is to have you on the podcast today. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. So I want to jump right in and talk about your show. Tell us about your show and why you started it. I started it in 2002, and I had been working in the engineering field. I was a telecom engineer. I worked in actual design of cellular networks and also in sales engineering. But I was ready for a change, and I had been volunteering on an NPR program, uh, a radio program doing essentially production work. So I would read a book, let's say, and I would write the intro, I would write the questions, I would prepare the host for the interview. In late 2001, I, you know, this was after 9-11, the economy took a nosedive very suddenly and I lost my job. I got laid off from my engineering job and I thought, I have nothing to lose at this point. Let me start my own program, at least I'll be doing something. And I was starting to have children at the time, so it just wasn't a good time for me to jump right back into corporate America. And uh, I did start that program, a radio program at the public access in here in Fairfax and uh, modeled it after that program on NPR. And I started and started getting guests. I started getting really fascinating guests in studio. I learned on the job and with each interview I did, I learned how to make it better, how to make it better and solicited feedback from people that were in the field and uh, was really enjoying it. And I thought, wow, this is a great program. Let me get a bigger audience. I started adding stations and going online. And this is 2002, right? <laughs> so there wasn't a lot going on. But XM radio, satellite radio, had just come on and was gaining in popularity. And so I called them up and I pitched them the program. And I got a lot of, yeah, yeah, but okay, we'll give it a listen. And Mark, it took two and a half years <laughs> from that first call to when I got the right guy to actually listen to my demo CD, to call me back, to tell me I love this program, I want to put it on in the air and for it to actually air wow. on Nationwide XM Radio. Wow. So yeah, I started doing that and uh, continued and they eventually had a merger in, I believe it was 2005, I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but Sirius and XM had a merger. So I went on, I survived the merger and I went on both those networks. And then I started saying, you know what, wouldn't it be fun if we got this on film, on camera, and I could put it on YouTube, I can air it on public access. And so I started doing that, I want to say in 2011. 
And you'll see on my YouTube channel, the very early <laughs> postings of just, it looks like a radio studio. It's very kind of kludgy with the big microphones and sitting in front of the guest and recording it essentially and started doing that. And I loved it. I loved the, the visual media. I, I loved that I was able to put in graphs or pictures or things like that. And started doing that. And then I pitched a PBS station here in Washington, D.C. and was able to go into now a TV studio and do an actual TV program. What did you focus on thematically and topically? Throughout most of the time, it was just public affairs. So I did anything about current events, anything about history, social sciences, the arts. It was real fun to have musicians come into the studio. And of course they would play for me or singer songwriters. And you'll be able to see those also on the YouTube channel, but that kind of thing, Middle Eastern affairs. So this was again, in the wake of 9-11. So there was a lot I felt that we should be doing in, in terms of educating the American public on what is Islamic radicalism? What is Islamism? What are the diverse cultures and religions of the Middle East? What's the nuance there? What's the history? Understanding Afghanistan, Iraq, the U.S. was, of course, very much involved in wars in those two countries. So that was really the focus then in in the PBS show on TV, I really did focus a lot more on international relations and foreign policy, and the goal being educating and informing the American public on American foreign policy and countries overseas. How do you think the Middle East has changed from then till now? You had, of course, the Arab Spring 10 years ago. That was a tectonic shift in the Middle East. And some things stay the same, but some things have changed dramatically. And people are no longer afraid of their governments like they used to be. They feel empowered. They saw the, the power of the people going into the streets could topple long-term dictators who've been in power. Hasim Barak's case was 30 years. I mean, that the average person has never known any other president in Egypt. So yeah, that definitely made a big difference in terms of U.S. foreign policy towards the Middle East. It has typically remained the same. No U.S. president is going to get elected unless he says that he supports Israel. So now that could be to varying degrees, but that's going to be, I think, for at least for now, the stable in U.S. Middle Eastern relations. How hard of a line you want to take on Iran, that's also a question. But I think except for the strange blip that we had during the, the Trump administration, it's going to be relatively stable. Do you think that the Middle East is better or worse as compared to where it was 10 years ago? I think certainly some things are much better. I think the change in governments has been, in general, a, a positive from the Arab Spring. I think Iraq is on the path. I'm cautiously optimistic about that. I think Turkey is going to remain a bigger problem for us and for the region. Syria is not yet in a place that, is, it's certainly not as stable as it was before the civil war. It's still struggling with that civil war. So yeah, there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of variation depending on what country you're talking about. What do you think about some of the normalizing relationships that have been happening between, for example, Israel and UAE, I think is, is one of them. Yeah, UAE, Bahrain, Sudan. In general, I think for those countries and for the United States, I think that's a positive. I think that's a win. However, for the Palestinians, they don't see it that way. Certainly. It, um, and I agree with them as the Arab states have sold them out for their own interests. It's true. There's no other way you can look at that. But I do think that there's still an opportunity for the Palestinians to really chart their own course, to come to the negotiating table. It's a tough issue. That's one issue that's very difficult. 
Your show seemed to be doing a lot of good, highlighting important issues, addressing key thinkers and decision makers, and providing this kind of context and nuance to geopolitics. Why was the show eventually discontinued? The station was at Howard University, which is an HBCU, historically black college and university. It was, of course, taken on as part of we want to diversify and things like that. But the station had decided that they wanted to be much more focused on African-American issues with programs for African Americans, in particular by African Americans. So my program really didn't fit into that objective. In your years in broadcasting, what have you learned and how has what you've learned impacted you? Me personally, I've learned a, a lot. I realize that I am much more of an empathetic person than I used to be. Sitting in front of somebody who has been a drug addict and has recovered from that, somebody who has struggled with mental illness, somebody who has been a refugee, somebody who's been homeless, somebody who has escaped from North Korea. These are experiences that I would never in my middle-class suburban life ever would have experienced or ever would have had the chance to talk to somebody like that. And so when I see that, I immediately have a lot more empathy. It has really made me into a much better person. And so I'm so glad. Aside from just learning so much, each program that I do, I really dive into the subject and really try to get as educated as possible and informed as possible on the subject. How has your career impacted your view of the government, our government leaders, and even the country as a whole? I'm much more of a political junkie, right, than, than your average <laughs> person. I'm following the news all the time. I'm following politics. I'm following international affairs. And I have to say it was alarming. The, the last four years during the Trump presidency, regardless of the actual policy, there has really been some alarming developments in government and really also in the media business. I think that media has become a lot more polarized, maybe in response to how polarized the American public has become. I do think that the Trump administration really emphasized the polarization that had already been happening in the United States. And then most alarmingly, at least from my perspective, is the demonization of the media. So immediately talking about the credibility of the media, calling them the enemy of the people, so that as soon as they start to criticize you, you can just say, you see, they're out to get me. It's all fake. Anything that, that doesn't agree with how I want things to come out is all of a sudden fake news. Are we in a post-truth world where there is actually something called alternative facts? I, I find that extremely disheartening and extremely alarming that politicians and, and spokespersons could actually get away with saying something like that. And I would hope that we start turning back from that kind of idea that you have facts and I have alternative facts. What agenda does the media have? It, it depends on who you're talking about. The media is a very broad term. I would say for the commercial ones are interested in ratings and advertising dollars. And in order to attract that, they do have to have people that believe in them and, and that want to support them. The, the commercial media, especially when we're talking about broadcast, is extremely big business. I, I looked it up today just so I could share this with you. Revenues for Fox News is $2.3 billion with a B. CNN is about half that, $1.2 billion. Of course, they've got lots of expenses, but that's big business right there. And in the case of, for instance, when they got rid of some of their high-profile anchors for, for sex abuse or um, sexual assault cases, it was because the advertisers said we're pulling our ads. It wasn't because they realized this was the right thing to do or not just the right thing to do. I, I don't want to impute something on them that maybe it might not be true. But yeah, that, that's big business. Now, when we talk about people say, what should we watch? What should we listen to? I, I would say definitely not the ones that are all the way on the right and all the way on the left. So you do not want to be listening to Fox News, especially not their opinion people, like not to name names, but Hannity and Carlson and Ingram. I, I think that they're way off and especially not anything farther to the right, like 
Newsmax or One America Network, that kind of thing. Also on the left, I wouldn't be watching MSNBC. I do watch CNN every so often, but things like BBC is a great outlet for TV and radio. I listen to NPR. I read the Washington Post. Those news organizations do have a process and standards as to what they consider news. So that's very important. The scary thing is you've got people out there that are pretending to be news and putting it out online. Oh, it's csnews.com. Who who the heck is that? (laughs) At best, it's opinion. At worst, it's made up. We really need to be very savvy in our consumption of news. Just like you need to eat a healthy diet if you want to stay healthy, you need to have a healthy diet of media as well. You need to be looking at things like factcheck.org. We were talking with some people I knew about the family separation at the border under the Trump administration, taking children from their parents. And somebody said to me, oh no, Obama separated a lot more kids at the border than Trump ever did. And I said, what? (laughs) And I went to factcheck.org and I found that this is apparently a common misconception that is absolutely patently false. But there's people that are like, oh no, because it fits with what we already want to believe. So then we'll just take it and we'll just swallow it and eat it and the truth be damned. (laughs) But we can't be like that. We as the American people cannot be like that. It sounds like, at least on the commercial side, that the customer of those news outlets, and when I say those news outlets, I mean like ABC, NBC, CBS, the big ones, right? The big three. It sounds like their customer is not really the person like you and I watching. It, It seems like it's really the advertisers. Yes, but it's indirectly us. If we stop watching, advertisers aren't going to want to advertise there. It's not going to be worth their money to advertise if there aren't eyeballs on the screen. So that's where you and I have the power. What about in public television? Who's the customer there? I I would highly recommend people watch and support their public TV stations or public radio stations and nonprofit news outlets because they're not beholden to to corporate power. They don't have to worry about, in some cases, yes, they, they get sponsorships. But theoretically, they're not beholden to to corporate power. What would you say to people, because there are a lot of them out there, that look at mainstream media and say that the media has a liberal bias? What would you say to those people? I would say that it's possible, but you be a savvy media consumer. I think going to places like C-SPAN, cspan.org. I I used to work for them, actually. They'll show you the sausage making going on in the U.S. Congress and other public affairs programming where there's nobody that's going to tell you anything. You see it for yourself. You can watch the debate on the Hill. You can listen to it on the radio as well in this area. Yeah. Be be a savvy consumer. Things like ProPublica is also a nonprofit. Very good reporting. And unless you want to go out and get your own reporting, you're going to have to trust somebody. How does the media prioritize its news stories? Because we have access now to news from all over the world. With social media, we have access to literally everything that's happening almost in real time. How does the media prioritize what it reports on? That's what news editors worry about all the time. There's the flippant phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. It depends on what's the most interesting, what's the most impactful to their audience. And it's sometimes hard to decide and what gets put in, what gets left out. And I think, unfortunately, sensationalism is now leading the news in in a lot of newsrooms. A lot has happened in the last year recently. The 2020 election process, we've had the pandemic going on, the president's recent challenge of the outcome, the storming of the Capitol, just so much news. And just for our listeners, Mimi and I originally had this interview scheduled for, I believe it was October before the election. And and actually Mimi made the the, the right call in postponing this till after the election. (laughs) And so much has happened since then. So all of these things are happening. How would you go about reporting on these things? 
I'm flabbergasted at everything that's happened. Having a U.S. president having primed the pump, really, on not accepting the election results if he lost. And and he'd been priming people since 2016 when he was asked flat out, are you going to accept the results of the election? And he said, well, we'll see. If I win, I will. And this is what happens when he doesn't win. And it's shocking how much that without evidence people will still believe him and instead actually see the evidence of this widespread fraud that was supposedly happening. And then storming of the Capitol. You see those images and you start thinking, that's not the United States right there, let alone really down the street from us here in the D.C. area. That can't be happening. This is not the United States. We, we see this kind of thing in other countries, right? Right. There is fraud in their elections. There's disputed uh, elections. There's storming. There's protests. There's riots. And we just sit here and watch and think in our smug little way, <laughs> oh, we're a democracy. That would never happen to us. And that was a wake-up call. Democracy is not something that we can take for granted. We need to be aware, uh, again, as the American public, this is our responsibility, that we hold our elected officials accountable to protecting that democracy, that the whole idea of accepting an election that you lost is central to democracy. And I remember watching inaugurations. I've been following politics for a long time, (laughs) probably since I was in uh, middle school. And I would sit and watch all those inaugurations and think, wow, how many people in the world get to see this? Where the outgoing president or the people that lost the election are sitting there clapping for the guy that won, going and walking him to his limo or his helicopter or whatever it may be, and and then going and taking power. How lucky are we that we have that? And that got called into question very recently. And I don't think we should forget about this easily. We should hold accountable everybody that was responsible in that in any form or fashion. And that, yes, we do need to heal. We do need to reconcile. I'm a strong believer in that. But in order to have true healing and true reconciliation, we have to have an accounting of the truth. Someone like Donald Trump, if you look at the news today, he's now out of office. The news reporting has gotten a little bit drier. It's just all about the business of the day. Was somebody like Donald Trump good for the media. In the cynical sense, he drove up ratings. Look, everybody was riveted by the horrible riot and uh, breach of the the U.S. Capitol. We didn't know how many people were going to die and if, if lawmakers or the vice president could have been killed. Let's not forget they were chanting, hang Mike Pence. That was our sitting vice president, regardless of what you think of him. We had practically all of our lawmakers uh, on the federal level in that building that was under attack. So yes, in that sense, he was good for ratings. Was he good for the country? I have my reservations about that. And frankly, people have been saying politics needs to be boring again. Politics needs to be in the background. We need to go back to the times where we're talking about Medicare and Social Security and health care reform and uh, a, a comprehensive immigration policy and welfare, climate change. None of that. The Trump presidency wasn't about policy. It was about feelings. It was a fear-based presidency. And regardless of the the policy issues that did come up, they were in the background. What do you think the United States reputation is on the world stage today? I think it's in the dumps. And I think we need to make a comeback. The United States obviously is the most powerful military in the world. That goes without saying. However, it was our soft power that really allowed us to have influence in the world. Everybody loved America. You you could go to Pakistan and they'll be burning the American flag, chanting death to America, and then they'll turn around and say, hey, can I get a visa? Can my kid go and study at one of your universities? So that's where I think we really need to improve. And let's not be sanguine about what just happened in in the Trump presidency. The dictators around the world learned from President Trump they learned to criticize the media and therefore nobody's going to believe them once they do when they say hey this is what's happening and this is what he did oh that's not true i try to to follow the arabic media there was commentary about 
you see? They're all so proud of their democracy that we don't want to be like that. This is what you get from democracy. Yeah, there's a lot that we need to do to improve our image around the world and to regain the the influence that we once had and the good influence, I want to say, that we once had. I want to back up from the media and actually just ask you just a few general advice and lessons learned questions. If you could share one secret of your success, what would that be? One secret to my success is to really try to be a very good listener. The key to to a good conversation is not so much how well you talk, but how well you listen. So if anybody wanted to compliment me, I want them to say she was a great listener. Also, there's no substitute for preparation to be hyper prepared. What's the most important lesson you've ever learned either in life or in business? The journey is more important than the destination. You might not get where you thought you were supposed to be going or where you wanted to get, but you will always learn from that journey. And if you focus on your faith in God and in knowing that what you're doing is the right thing and to always do the right thing, then that journey will be amazing. If you could offer one piece of advice to the world, what would that be? Stay informed. Don't just listen to people that confirm your beliefs. Go and and talk to other people, listen, search, do your own research, and don't just forward stuff on Facebook without checking it. Fantastic. What do you want most for your life? I had the chance to interview the late former governor of New York, Mario Cuomo. He's since passed on. But I asked him, I said, how do you want to be remembered? And he said, you know what I want on my tombstone? I want it to say he tried. And... I guess that's what I want. I want to be known as somebody that tried to do the right thing, that tried to improve the world in some small way. Even if it's just raising my kids, that's enough for me. I certainly think that through the illustrious career that you've had so far, and I don't think you're finished by any stretch of the imagination, uh, I think you you have had an impact, and I think you will continue have, to have an impact, Mimi. You, if you want to be found, uh, where can people find you and connect with you online? So I have my YouTube channel is up, and I read all the comments. Obviously, I don't respond to everything, but I do read it all. So that's at YouTube. I think the channel is called The Mimi G show. So do look for me there and give me some encouraging likes and and shares and things like that. Fantastic. Mimi, this has been uh, just an awesome time together. Thank you so much for taking time with me and, and, and sharing your wisdom and experience and really helping me and my audience to be better informed about how the media works. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me.